this year the tragic killings of black Americans due to police have sparked worldwide protests and highlighted the racism that still exists in many environments. Regardless of industry, organizations have reiterated their commitment to racial diversity, yet are often unequipped with the best tools and knowledge to manage black, indigenous and people of color. In this session, I'm very happy to welcome Christian Pierce as an expert in this field to discuss with me the topic and um, give recommendations to leaders how they can implement and support BIPOC people. I um, would like to first thank our sponsors who made this uh, Diversity and Inclusion Week, these online sessions possible. Thanks a lot. And uh, would first ask and introduce Christian to introduce to yourself who you are. Thank you, Gudrun. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning if you're listening outside of Switzerland or good evening if you're listening in another location as well. My name is Christian Pierce. I'm from the United States originally, and I grew up all over the East Coast. The US government considers me race, black, skin tone medium, something that I came to understand during my academic adventures. I went to high school in Athens, Georgia, where I was one of only two African Americans to graduate from my class, after which I attended the United States Military Academy at West Point. I graduated with a bachelor's in economics and served five and a half years on the active duty US Army. During that time, I had two combat deployments, one of which I was an air defense liaison officer. So I was the only American working with Arab Air Forces, which gave me a unique perspective into reverse mentorship and cultural diversity. After leaving the military, I attended the Copiage Graduate School of Business in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where my thesis focused on cultural and ethnic diversity in Brazil, while I also helped start a diversity committee at our school. During that time, I went to Bogota, Colombia, where I helped a colleague start an organization called Talento Total. His idea has taken foot in Brazil and Colombia in helping BIPOC people get into grad school in the US. After graduating, I started as an independent consultant and given the events that have occurred have pivoted into really helping organizations understand and educate themselves on how to become better leaders and really help manage their racial diversity. I'm now based out of Zurich, Switzerland, and this is where I'm speaking to you from today. Thank you very much, Christian. We met each other uh, at LinkedIn. So you addressed me asking what we do here at the Competence Center for Diversity and Inclusion concerning racial diversity. And you know, I was reflecting and I had to say, yeah, we are not doing a lot, I have to admit. We do not have a lot of experiences here with uh, racial diversity in our competence center. And that's how we uh, started our conversation and got in contact and um, are also planning several projects together. So um, I would like to ask the participants um, two questions. Julio, would you be so kind and help me with the questions? And the first one is, how important is racial diversity in Switzerland to your opinion? Do you say very important or um, important, less important or not important at all? Okay, I see the answers coming. Yeah, close to more than 40% find it a very important topic and another quarter important. So the majority sees it as an important topic. And therefore the next question we are interested in is in your company 
is racial diversity a focus area in your diversity strategy? Yes or no? Okay. So the answers are nearly half half. Yep. And I, I think I would say that's uh, quite a situation here in Switzerland. So from the awareness, also because of the Black Lives Matters movement and, um, and the news, there is more awareness now for the topic, but it's not uh, reflected in the focus areas in, uh, in a lot of uh, diversity strategies in companies. So, um, when we started our collaboration, uh, Christian, we, we also discussed uh, the following questions we, are, we want to uh, also discuss here now together with the participants. I just want to remind the participants that you again can pose your questions in the Q&A uh, sections. So feel free to, to write your questions. I would like to start with, uh, with the first question, Christian, why is the topic of racial diversity so important? Can you give us some insights? Sure. So when you look at the topic of racial diversity amongst all other types of diversity that organizations are now dealing with, we understand that when companies start to manage racial diversity, because it's not just about having diversity of race in your organization, it's about how you actually manage it. When you do that, you're able to better attract talent. You're able to retain that talent much better. You're, ba you're better able to expand into markets and customer bases that you wouldn't previously be able to. And we'll get into empathy in a little bit. And then Ultimately, when you're looking at the bottom line for companies, you're able to perform financially better when you are managing racial diversity than your competitors in that industry who aren't actually managing. it. Then when you look outside of the organization or the industry itself, we look at managing racial diversity for equality, equity, and fairness. Mm. A lot of countries, industries, and organizations have had systemic racism within their policies. And what that has done has marginalized BIPOC people and limited their potential in order to gain positions of higher responsibility. Exactly. You are, uh, besides all the economic reason that, reasons that also count for, for the whole categories of diversity, and uh, the usual arguments, it's, uh, in my opinion, also very important that it's a matter of, of fairness and equal opportunities. Because when, when we look at the statistics, you know, um, there is um, by far no equal opportunities for BIPOC people. And that's a shame because we, we lose a lot of, of talent, as you mentioned, um, talent that could contribute to the companies, to the organizations. Um, so um, let's, let's talk about uh, a little bit more about, um, about the what. So if we then um, say, okay, we are convinced it's an important topic and the majority of our participants have the same feeling, but um, as, as uh, we realized all together, we do not have a lot of experiences. We do not have the tools in place. Um, it's uh, compared to gender um, equality, for example, where it, I would say in Switzerland, it's uh, far more advanced, the topic. Um, we are lagging behind. So what, in your opinion, is, is important and is especially important to know for line managers, for leaders about the topic? Great question, especially when you look at the Swiss environment. And going back to those poll questions, you know, the Swiss government in 2018 had a statistic put out that 58% of the population sees racial diversity as an issue. So when we know that this is something we need to approach in the Swiss business environment, I recommend three things for line managers and leaders to do. First is to gain insight. Second 
is to mitigate issues. And then third is to create inspiration. So let's start. What do you mean to, when you say to gain insights? What is specially? So when I say gain insight, what I mean is that a leader is really gaining a deeper understanding of their BIPOC employees. We've seen throughout the summer, a number of businesses say, you know, hashtag let's talk about black or hashtag I hear you. Well, a leader can say I hear you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're listening or even more so inculcating the stories that their BIPOC team members are discussing. So the first big thing about gaining insight is really developing empathy. So taking time, not necessarily to have to experience what a BIPOC team member has experienced, but to be able to understand those feelings that a BIPOC employee has gone through. So when they discuss those times of racial discrimination or when they felt fear or even anger or hate because they know that there has been racism. Not necessarily saying, okay, like I, I, I haven't experienced it, what, I, what can I do? But really appreciating that that person has taken the energy and really relived a traumatic experience in order to share it with that leader. And so in turn, it's really important for leaders to really get to know their employees, but in a way that allows them to keep an open perspective and really listen and really develop the empathy to know that this is where their BIPOC team members are coming from. That, that's very important. Um, or um, yeah, that, that you mentioned the empathy because we were talking about the deep level diversity on Monday with another colleague. Um, and there was also empathy was in the center of uh, understanding and being a good team leader, um, enabling inclusion and psychological safety. So empathy, empathy is the, is the, like the first part, but, um, how can they then use, you know, being more empathic? What does this mean then in everyday uh, situations? How can leaders then better, like, let's say, manage um, mm -hmm. the topic? So it actually goes into a word that we often use and something that you just mentioned, which is the I in diversity and inclusion, inclusion many people start great ideas or have the initiative of something that involves dni but what they're lacking and what the empathy offers as a pathway is to create a true environment where bipoc people feel supportive so what we mean by that environment is a workplace where in the office people feel comfortable to express issues, to talk with their first line supervisors or the C-suite as well, if they're approached or if there's an open door policy about these issues. It's important when a leader starts to create this is to have a balance and to be able to have a perspective where it allows everyone to have their say, not in a combative way, not creating dissension, but in a way that creates unison. So that's when we talk about diversity, that's one of the beauties of it is the diversity of perspectives. Well, what you want to do is get the most out of all of your employees, but especially with your BIPOC team members, is making them feel welcome. And not in, we, we talk about tokenism, not in a way where you have that one black employee and you want to stereotype and try and talk about let's say rap music or something like that, but actually really getting to know them and to understand their background in a way that allows them to feel comfortable to start talking about things that may bother them in the workplace without fear of repercussion from their colleagues or from higher up as well. What we see in a lot of organizations is that there is systemic racism or there is overt racism that can occur 
or even things that we'll get into later, but people aren't willing to discuss it or bring it up because they don't feel comfortable in this environment. So yeah. leaders need to create an environment that is truly inclusive, that allows BIPOC team members to feel supported that they can say these things. I totally agree, yeah. And how can then, um, what, what can help then like mitigate these this issue, issues? So when we talk about mitigating issues, there are two things that are really toxic in the worst workplace outside of overt racism. Because what we notice is as organizations become more structured within the culture of that organization, there may be no tolerance for racism or discrimination. And this isn't necessarily limited to BIPOC people, you know, there's policies against sexual harassment and gender discrimination or disability. But what we see occur are that instead of this overt racism that occurs, there can be things like gaslighting or what we call microaggressions. And those can really be detrimental to leaders. Can you explain a little bit more in detail what is gaslighting? Sure. So when we look at gaslighting, one of the big things is understanding where that actually comes from, which is an old movie called Gaslight, where a husband essentially manipulated his wife into thinking she was crazy. Now, when we look at gaslighting in the context of racial discrimination, what that normally is, is someone questioning the reality of a BIPOC person in a way that makes that person question their own sanity or their own situation. So it becomes very toxic because when leaders do start creating a very supportive environment and people do start speaking up, what we may have is that gaslighting starting to creep in from employees who say, you know, if I'm dealing with racial discrimination, I say, you know, I think this guy here said something racist to me. Well, someone else may come along and say, are you sure that's racist? No, he has a black wife. He can't be racist. No, you know, it's, it's not just racism. It's, it's, it's just a socioeconomic difference. It's a class difference. It's not race. And so what occurs with this gaslighting is that the narrative becomes extremely convoluted in a way that makes the actual issue at hand, which is rooting out this racism, not possible because the issue becomes so nebulous. That reminds me a little bit of, uh, of uh, similar situations, I would say, um, years ago concerning gender uh, diversity. Also, a lot of comments, ah, it was only a joke. It's not that, that serious. Why are you mm -hmm. so... Um, yeah, like uh, you don't have humor or, or whatever, all these situations. And that's uh, why I uh, appreciated the Me Too movement so much mm -hmm. because it gives this, this space of uh, a common feeling. It's not me alone and I'm doubting about my perceptions and my feelings, but I see others are also have the same uh, challenges and, and see it in a similar way. So... Um, then let's let's turn around. How can I, as a leader, um, mitigate gaslighting? Then, what would so you recommend? The the big thing as a leader is to first not fall prey to gaslighting yourself, mm -hmm. and in doing so, you need to take any claim of racism seriously. So, in tying in with the empathy in the supportive environment, when someone says that they have felt discriminated against because of the way they look or because of their skin color, instead of immediately questioning if they really feel discriminated, a leader really needs to sit back and listen and start empathizing and taking in that perspective of that person. And in doing so, looking at whoever may have caused the gaslighting or you know maybe the accuser and starting to see where that person is coming from or what that person has done in the past as well when you look at gaslighting and combating it overtly 
oftentimes it can be seen from many different perspectives as a negative because there are others who don't understand gaslighting themselves. And so oftentimes for a leader, it's very important to ensure that everyone in the organization knows that there's no tolerance for gaslighting, but taking care in punishing or disciplinary action behind the scenes in a way where the person who was gaslighting knows that they are being disciplined for that. While the person who was on the end of this racial discrimination knows that you have their back and are supporting them and actually taking action when they make these claims or when this does occur in your organization. So when other people start to see that this person who was the gaslighter was disciplined, they know that that is not tolerated. Even yeah. if it's not, you know, a company-wide email or policy that's sent out. The action or the consequence for that is much more important than the words that are posted publicly. Mm -hmm. I see. You also mentioned um, another topic, uh, microaggression. Can you give like um, some examples how this happens in day-to-day -day conversation situations? Yeah, so a microaggression is really any type of subliminal or indirect discriminatory act towards somebody. And these are really, really toxic because oftentimes, similar to gaslighting, a BIPOC person may experience or know that a microaggression is occurring, while the person who is the microaggressor may not have even realized it, you know, mm. getting into unconscious bias. And so yeah. we look at we look at examples of microaggressions as a a black employee gets onto an elevator and there may be a white woman employee as well who clutches her purse without realizing it. Or, mm. you know, uh, one of the one of the the things that I hear often that people don't even realize they're doing is when they uh, they see me like different from when I have my natural hair and then when I have a haircut, like, oh, you look very, very professional. Or, you know, after I've I've talked to somebody, especially in the US or something, and they say, Oh, you have you have very good English. Yeah. And yeah. you know, just yeah. these little things which do sound like compliments, but then when you start looking at the historical context of these the microaggression is rooted in a subliminal racism that the person may not realize because of the systemic racism within the organization mm -hmm. or within mm -hmm. the system or culture that they live. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was just loving insight because I remember a situation where a colleague of mine, same age, same uh, hierarchical level uh, said to me, oh, we are so proud of you that you managed to bring up this new program. <laughs> And I think that that's exactly the kind of example uh, you are uh, tickling at with microaggression. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so let's assume I have gained uh, some insights. I would assume it's a learning journey, um, but also would you, for example, at, uh, at this stage recommend like unconscious bias trainings for leaders? So I would, there is, there is a lot of value that can be gained from unconscious bias training, but it needs to be in hand with other initiatives within the organization yeah. as well. Because when you have unconscious bias training, it's often great because it does allow people to realize their own implicit biases, but that's only one side of the equation. What you have to offer as well is the empowerment for BIPOC employees and team members to know how to talk with their teammates about mm -hmm. microaggressions or call them out. Because usually what happens is it's a stereotype within that unconscious bias that just needs to be talked about and communicated. Now, another thing that's extremely important is looking at the organization as a whole. Is unconscious bias training actually solving the problem or is it causing a short-term fix when the organization has some policies that are actually systemically racist that yeah. also need to be changed. So usually unconscious bias training in conjunction with another policy change or 
BIPOC empowerment as well, or allyship training is very, very beneficial. Very important. And also uh, look at the, at the more um, systemic and structural process side of, of the company, whether there is a systematic uh, racism, maybe also. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Let's assume leaders have now gained some insight and uh, mitigated issues. How do they now create inspiration? So, you know, in, when we look at creating in the inspiration, in the military, we always saw great leaders as those who created inspiration through empowering their soldiers to go above and beyond what they perceived was their own potential. And really in business, it's no different. When we look at creating inspiration for BIPOC employees specifically, what that really means is creating this idea of representation or showing BIPOC team members, not really just where they are, but where they can go or what they can achieve and that there is equity and equality in the system that is going to give them a fair chance to achieve that. So would, would at this point um, quotas help? So that's, that's a great question. And you know, that's something that I witnessed personally when I was studying in Brazil, the impact of quotas versus let's say an affirmative action program in the US. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at quotas, a quota system is taking a specific number of spaces and allotting those for you know, in this case, uh, BIPOC people. And so in that situation, what the organization is trying to do is essentially undo their systemic racism by giving people an immediate shot. It's a short term fix that can start to create a long term solution. The issue you have with a quota system is the buy-in from the majority who are already in the organization and then those who miss a shot because of the quota. So you have to implement, if you are an organization that's looking to implement quotas, you have to do so in a way that allows your employees to understand that this is for a long-term solution of the company. It may not you know, when you look at the, the applications, a quota system may let someone in who may be perceived as less qualified, but once they're actually trained or in that environment, they may perform better than the person who may have the initial qualifications better. We look at things um, like the quote unquote black tax that many people have where they may be supporting their mother, they may be supporting other family members as they try and progress in their own career. And so there may be a limitation perceived on their CV, but really they're working harder than someone that has these qualifications. Mm -hmm. So to sum up and answer your question, in situations I do believe quotas can offer a solution when they're implemented correctly. When you just implement them and say, here's a quota, and you don't explain the intention, or you don't actually create a system of support for the people in the quota system, it's bound to fail. But when you implement that and then you explain it in a way that has the proper buy-in from the rest of the organization, you can successfully implement a quota. Mm. Because when we are talking about rep representation uh, and what you mentioned with the, with the inspiration to have like role models in uh, higher hierarchies or in talent pools and so on that you, you see as a BIPOC uh, uh, member that's possible. So that's not, uh, I mean, we are not, uh, we, we are not ending up as interns, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm just tipping uh, to, to an example you gave me uh, when, when mm -hmm. we uh, were discussing this topic. So to see like, the, yeah, uh, role, having role models, seeing that it's possible, it's not, uh, it's, it's just normal. Yeah. And then, as you mentioned, quotas, uh, if they are, done correctly, implemented uh, in a good way, can have a positive, positive impact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, 
when 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 we discussed the topic you also mentioned the idea of uh, reverse mentoring can you elaborate a little bit on on this idea why is this so fruitful and impactful um, for for the topic sure so when you know we talk we did talk about representation and the impact that can have and you know that's actually it's really heavy on my mind given the unfortunate uh death of Chadwick Boseman recently, who inspired many of us with his performances, not just in Black Panther, but, you know, in 42. And the fact that seeing that was inspirational in a way that empowers those BIPOC employees who may be at a lower level. And similar to, actually, I just saw uh, Mino post a question on, uh, what I think the responsibility of minority employees in terms of initiating discussions on related to races. And it's the same actually in context of reverse mentorship. So when we look at the implementation of reverse mentorship programs in organizations, what this isn't is a soundboard for younger employees just to complain or to try and tell senior executives how the company should be run. What it really is is a knowledge sharing in a way that actually creates a stronger organization by allowing senior executives to learn from the experiences of these younger employees in a way that broadens their perspective. So when we go back to talking about empathy as well, what this allows is, you know, someone who's coming in right after an undergraduate career, you know, I think about some of the kids or the young adults or the professionals I worked with in Brazil who this is their first job. They're in an industry where they may be one of 10 or eight black employees in this whole organization. And so their voice has a perspective that the senior leadership can use. Now, how do you implement that? You create a way where the younger employee is able to be in an environment where they know that they're able to talk, but that they aren't talking over or trying to dictate what the senior executive is doing. And the senior executive at that point is having the humility to be able to have this conversation and really just sit back and listen. And there may be things that they're able to implement. There may be things that they don't necessarily implement in the organization. But what it should do is enable that organization to ultimately manage diversity better in the short run, but also start to empower those BIPOC team members to know that they have that line of communication and that the organization really does care about their future as they progress. Now, in terms of actually initiating these discussions, it's often best if the organization has some type of program for reverse mentorship. Even though it can be done informally, it's often best when you're looking at managing diversity in general for the organization to take charge. Should minority employees then feel obligated necessarily to initiate discussions on race? Yes and no there needs to be a knowledge sharing and a discussion that is had, but it shouldn't always be the responsibility of a BIPOC employee to have to educate the majority of, you know, their white or their non BIPOC team members. To it's very answer exhausting. Me question yeah. As well. yeah. It's very exhausting when you are always in this, this role of uh, explaining and educating uh, the rest. Or the, the majority. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, before I, I look at the yeah at the clock, uh, before I open for for the questions of the participants, I would ask you to just summarize. You know, to um, what are the three let's say three most important recommendations for leaders for companies you would give from your perspective to manage racial diversity. Absolutely. So just to recap, the big thing first off is gain insight. You gain insight through empathy and empathizing with your employees. 
and through creating a BIPOC supportive work environment where people feel comfortable being able to have these conversations. The second is to mitigate issues. So not just the overt racism, but really the toxic things like gaslighting and microaggressions in the workplace. You can empower both your BIPOC and your non-BIPOC employees through initiatives in order to have these conversations, in order to break down those implicit biases and those stereotypes in order to strengthen your organization. And then finally, that third point is creating inspiration. So offering representation to your BIPOC employees, either internally through the organization or externally, showing other examples of how the glass ceiling has been broken for them to see what they can achieve in the future. And then finally, a reverse mentorship program, which allows for knowledge sharing and the ability for your BIPOC employees who are at a lower level to share a perspective that helps the larger organization and the leadership create a more inclusive environment. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I just uh, look at my, my other uh, item to see what questions are in there. So, oh yeah, there are several. Let's pick the first one. So, um, depends also on what is understood by white. If we consider that almost 40% of Swiss have an immigration background and racism in Switzerland is being happening between people without immigration background and people with immigration history, then Swiss society is not so white anymore considering people with migration background BIPOC. So like a, another perspective, it was more like a, a comment here. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I missed the first question. And that's the question. How racist was Switzerland? Yeah, the first question, sorry. The first question was, how would you rate Switzerland in a scale of racism reality from one to 10, 10 the highest? So to your really very personal experience now here in Switzerland. So, so uh, I really, I, and I did, I saw uh, the comment as well. So before I get into the, the question, I'll just uh, kind of address that comment at first. When we talk about BIPOC, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, there's a difference between what we see in racial diversity and cultural diversity as well. And so when we look at a place like Switzerland, which does have immigration, what can also occur is not just racism, but discrimination because of background, um, you know, an ethnocentric or Swiss view that causes discrimination because of someone's nationality. So getting into the actual question on a scale of one to 10, one being the lowest, 10 being the highest, I would Given, given my interactions, I would put Switzerland at about a six to seven. You know, it's definitely not, not the most racist place I've ever been. But in a lot of the interactions um, in the Swiss business environment, you see a lot of disdain for racial diversity. Um, you see a lack of understanding or a lack of importance. And then one of the, the key things that I've noticed, so people discuss the culture of Switzerland uh, before I, I got here. And, you know, I, I actually find everyone to be fairly friendly and open, but the key is microaggressions. I've noticed that there are a large number of microaggressions that occur and people don't even realize it, but it's just because they've lived in this bubble. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons that you and I are here having that conversation mm -hmm. is to really inform people in the Swiss business environment, how to understand these things and how to really break that down. So Alexandra, thank you for uh, that question. Then I would move to the question of um, Edinalva. She asks, what is your strategy plan and goals for BIPOC awareness in the Swiss environment? How long do you think it would take for implementation? So that's a great and question. The environment so, sorry, sorry, yeah. Yep. I was just looking so, at the second. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, when we look at a time frame of implementation, it's very objective or goal based. So currently I work with a few different organizations within Switzerland and the goals are somewhat open right now. We're starting to refine and look at specific metrics quantitatively because when you look at dealing with BIPOC awareness it often as this conversation exemplifies starts as a very qualitative piece because it's all about the person's perception or what BIPOC people feel and so as far as an overarching strategy and plan the the goal is to make Switzerland one of the most racially diverse managed environments possible. And what I mean by that is not necessarily, you know, you hear people say, oh, an organization only works if half of the organization is BIPOC and the other half is, is white. And that's not necessarily what we mean when we talk about equality and equity and diversity management, especially in terms of Switzerland. What we mean is that the percentage, I believe it's about 17% off the top of, um, of uh, foreigners who or in Switzerland, have equity and equality and fairness when it comes to job opportunities in the workplace. And that when they're actually in an organization that is Swiss, that they are managed and supported. Mm. And um, concerning this topic, what I realized uh, when you look at the statistics is, of course, we have a lot of foreigners here in Switzerland. I'm one too. Julio is one, you are one. So yeah, it's, it's quite common also to have, uh, for example, in executive boards, a lot of foreigners. But if you look at the group of foreigners, they are then from the neighboring countries. And that's it. So there is also like, um, I would say, different shades of, of being a, a, a foreigner here in, in, in Switzerland. And, uh, and uh, BIPOC people definitely have, uh, have it more difficult here than the foreigners, let's say, only from, from the neighboring countries. There's something with the, the voice now. Christian, do you hear me? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Small technical yeah. issue here. Yeah, perfect. I, I can hear you fine, just in a quick changeover. Please continue. Um, okay, another question is, in your experience, how effective is it to have an ombudsperson as a point of contact in a company for raising cases of discrimination anonymously? So to have like a, yeah, like a, a person you, you can mm -hmm. explain. So, your so when we look at anonymous reporting, it's, it's a bit of a, a touchy issue depending on the organization. And that kind of goes back to looking at creating a supportive environment. While it is usually great that people feel willing to report something, a lot of the times, having something reported anonymously isn't always actually anonymous. And what we see is that people then kind of go on this quote unquote witch hunt or this fact finding mission to find out who that person is. And oftentimes there are repercussions or consequences that that person faces when they think that they've reported anonymously so that they can be safe at the end, it may come back to damage them more because other people who find out about it will accuse them of trying to ruin someone's career or, you know, going back to the gaslighting issue. What, what we've noticed and what we've seen and through my personal experience with a few organizations is that it's better to not keep things anonymous, to actually, you know, let the, the person who has purported this racism know who their accuser is but then the accuser has the full support of the organization and having having that actually what we've seen in certain situations creates 
the incentive for more people to actually report. Because now when we talk about representation, you know, if, if you know that someone who looks like you is being supported and they're reporting on issues that occur to you, then you're more likely to support. But a lot of times if it's anonymous, it can be detrimental. So mm -hmm. my, so, my person, or go ahead. Yep. Yeah. So if I got you right, um, you say, it's not always a good idea to keep this uh, anonymously, but um, integrate it in the culture, develop a safe space, a, an inclusion culture where such issues can be addressed uh, without then, um, I don't know if I got this right, finger uh, pinting or, uh, or a scapegoat um, searching and, and, and so on. Sure. You know. So, so when we look at supportive spaces, uh, a lot of times when you have that proper support, some of these issues can actually be mitigated at the first line. So it doesn't actually even need to be reported because right on the spot, you know, like if let's say I, I, I get called the N word, um, which has happened in professional spaces that I would never imagine it occurring. Mm -hmm. You know, so at that point, if I confront that person right off the bat, instead of trying to do things like and report it behind the scenes, that usually nips it in the bud. And when I say nip it in the bud, such an American <laughs> phrase, but it usually just stops that. And that person recognizes that they have erred. But a lot of times when you see if you go behind and you report it or you try and get it through these channels, that's when if you don't have a truly supportive environment, the gaslighting can start to creep in or that person isn't necessarily punished. Mm -hmm. And so it is extremely important to empower your BIPOC employees and have these safe spaces. Now, if they have tried to mitigate it at their own level and it doesn't work, that's when going back to that previous question, taking it to the next level, but not remaining anonymous seems to be the most effective policy. Yeah. Um, another question is here from uh, Gianluca. Might a quota for BIPOC not fostering systematic racism exclusion in the long term? Existing employees of an organization with the necessary qualification might feel cheated and through this dissatisfaction be inclined to commit microaggressions? So that's a, that's a great question. And that, that is exactly what I meant when I started to discuss the buy-in. So there, there is definitely a risk of microaggressions being committed if you just implement a quota system and you don't create the organizational diversity management program to really implement those people who have gotten into the organization through the quota system. And then at the same time, you haven't empowered those who are already in the organization. So yes, there's definitely a reality that people will feel cheated. But then what we've seen is when you have the guidelines put in place, and certain even negative consequences for people who are enacting microaggressions or trying to disrupt the organizational structure because of these people who have made it into the quota system, then it can be implemented much better than without. You know, when we look at case studies from Brazil, you and I uh, had also talked about self-identification, which is a a whole yep. nother, nother topic to get into. But when you have quota systems implemented in universities and people are just allotted these slots, but they aren't given any support themselves, what we see is that they face a large amount of discrimination from their peers who don't understand that this person is here, not because somebody else didn't deserve to be here, but it's because ultimately there were centuries of systemic racism which marginalize this person mm -hmm. or people from their background. Yeah. 
I have another two questions I would like to ask you, and then uh, we are probably <laughs> coming to an end. So one question is, what is the best way to discuss or debate uh, these issues of systemic racism and race awareness in an environment where people are not willing to admit to even the existence of racism, discrimination in Switzerland? So when a commentary in the chat, which is also very good, it says people that say, I don't see race. I don't see race, mm -hmm. exactly. That's the, how, how do you suggest uh, to counter statements like, I don't see race? So that's, that's <laughs> it, to, use, to use a popular example going on right now, you know, that's the all lives matter versus black lives matter state mm. i don't see race ever we're all we're all humans and what i actually uh, what i do in switzerland i take from my experience in brazil which when you look at the brazilian environment to swiss environment it doesn't really seem comparable at first you know switzerland has what, like about nine million people brazil has about 200 million with 54 percent afro uh descendant and in brazil people say Oh no, you know, there's uh, somo todos brasileiros. We're all we're all Brazilian. Like there's no racism. But when you look at the business environment at the manager level, seventy percent is white. Going up to director, you get about ninety, and then you know C-suite, it's about ninety-five to ninety-eight percent, depending on the organization. So something is up there. So it's similar to Switzerland in that regard, where people sort of start saying it's not racism, you know, it's, it's immigrants who have come in that just, you know, they haven't performed well or they haven't done this and, you know, Switzerland, this is kind of how we are. So the biggest piece and the biggest success that I normally have is walking people through the history mm -hmm. of a country and a culture. So when you start looking at these cultural similarities or this history, you get to these pivotal points in time where there are essentially discriminatory policies. And this, you know, this is something that isn't just limited to BIPOC people. It's, you know, gender discrimination, it's uh, LGBT plus discrimination as well. And so when you start looking at the history of country or cultural organization, and then you go from the history to the present situation, you can usually start to enlighten people and start to build momentum on that discussion of racism and discrimination. So when we talk about things like, you know, even Black Lives Matter in Switzerland, and we're talking about the phrase Black Lives Matter, not necessarily the political organization based in the US, when you start looking at the history of that movement or why people are saying that, there's usually something that is tied in with systemic racism or when you look at this vote that's coming up in switzerland soon that is an opportunity to get involved in this discussion and so there are little you know when we we look at businesses and marketing and selling there are these windows of opportunity where you can really target and and it's the same with conversations on racism and discrimination you look for a window of opportunity and then when you target what you want to say you trace back the history and then you go from history to the present state. So that's a very good advice to, to bring in history and uh, where all this discrimination and racism happens to bring this to the awareness and also to have a look at the facts. To my experience, it's always very helpful, you know, to see we have this huge um, a proportion of well qualified people, uh, be it uh, young women, be it uh, BIPOC people, or whatever. And when we look then up the hierarchical level, we see them diminishing and uh, we don't, we, we, we always have this pyramid and not, we are talking about now of a, like a silo, you know, mm -hmm. if you have talent uh, at the bottom uh, line or in lower management levels, just to make sure to bring them up and not lose them in a, in a pyramid. And this would be like the metaphor yeah. I would like yeah. to use also for this topic. <laughs> So I want to thank you very much, Christian, for your insights, for um, this really spontaneous idea to contribute to our D&I week here. And I look very much forward to our further 
collaboration. And uh, thanks again to the participants for the active contribution and the questions. We look forward to our next session tomorrow. Uh, a big one, yeah, <laughs> Julia is saying a big one. Uh, we ha have the release of the fourth gender intelligence report and the uh, gender maturity compass tomorrow. Also, the session will also be in English. So for our uh, more international audience, probably very helpful. And then two other sessions on Friday. So thanks again for attending. Thank you, Christian, for your contributions and have a nice rest of the day. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day.